What's going on, everybody? Um, today, I'm going to try something a little different. There's this free-to-play game called Dagon, Dagon, I don't know, by H.B. Lovecraft. And uh, from what I understand, this is a bit of a interactive version of a, a book of his that he wrote, which is going to give us some information about the Cthulhu mythos and stuff like that. Um, I don't really know very much at all about the whole Cthulhu and all of H.P. Lovecraft's mythos. So I thought this would be interesting. Uh, they say you can play it in like a half an hour or so. So I thought it might be to try to do this as a recording instead of doing it as a, a stream. Uh, I do normally stream on Twitch, so twitch.tv slash robsteady. Uh, I'm trying to do a little bit more than I do, than I have been. Something like that. Um, but like I said, I thought this might be a neat way to try to do something a little different and we'll see how it goes. All right. So let's, uh, get over to my desktop and let's see. Once it loads, you know. I gotta say, I love just that, that art. It looks so cool to me. Okay. Uh, I guess there's trivia. Well, I don't know anything about them, so. There are other games too, apparently. Dagon, Dagon by HP Lovecraft. There's the Eldritch Box DLC. Oh, you can't even see this because of where I am. But the Eldritch Box DLC, the Little Glass Bottle DLC, Tales of Herring Lake. Again, I don't know anything about HP Lovecraft. So, uh, for now, we'll just, we'll stick with the, uh, the main part of the game. See how it goes. Dagon is a faithful interactive adaptation of HP Lovecraft's work focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices, action sequences, or inventory management here, and movement is limited to progressing through locations along the plot. Along with the plot. Okay. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Oh yeah? It's a nasty looking place. Ah! During the game you'll find... You will encounter interactive elements. Some of them will allow you to continue your journey. Others reveal interesting facts about the original short story, its historical background, and the author. Some of the trivia is hidden. In order to find these secrets, focus your eyes and look for the elder sign. So I guess that's the, the, the leaf, like the, the tree branch thing. Uh, you can also access all found facts later. They will be available in the main menu. I guess that's all there is so far. Just the one thing. Okay. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. It sounds like fun. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. Forgetfulness or death. Those seem like... <laughs> I don't line up my camera. Uh, they seem like they're... Those are, those are some options. Okay, morphine entered into the use in the 19th century and was routinely administered to treat severe pain during the American Civil War of 1861 to 1865 and World War I, 1914 to 1918. It was also sold without restrictions until 1914. That's kind of crazy. Uh, morphine became more popular after the invention of the hypodermic syringe around 1854. Uh, Friedrich Serturner, who first isolated the substance, originally named it Morphium after Morpheus, the Greek god associated with dreams. At the time when Dagon was published, morphine abuse, known as soldier's disease, 
already posed a big problem in the United States. So we go all the way to back then, having issues with addictions to stuff. That's pretty crazy. I guess that was it, huh? It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. Interesting. Something's going boom. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation. The Hun, what, um, I don't know what the reference is, like, what the Hun is. So that our vessel was made a legitimate prize whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. Was the Hun maybe the ship that they were on? The Huns were Central Asian nomads. Oh, they're actually talking about the Huns. Okay. I didn't... I don't know. For some reason, it didn't even register to me that they were still active as the Huns at that point. Um, let's see. There were Central Asian nomads who established a dominion in Europe and invaded the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. They were known as brutal, deadly warriors and masters of quick raids who also developed powerful composite bows, lassos, and early siege weapons. During World War I, the British used the word Hun as a synonym for Germans. Oh, in order to emphasize their brutality. However, the term originated when the German Emperor Wilhelm II gave a speech to his troops on the 27th of July, 1900, before they embarked to China. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated. No quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into our hands is forfeited. Just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under their King Attila made a name for themselves, one that even today makes them seem mighty in history and legend. May the name German be affirmed by you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever again dare to look cross-eyed at a German. The refusal to take prisoners was a clear breach of the laws and customs of war adopted during the first Hague Convention of 1899. Oh. Well then. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. Wow. That's pretty crazy. Okay. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Hmm. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. That does not sound like a, uh, a fun way to be out to sea. But anyway... Is there nothing for me to do here? Oh. Oh, I didn't know if I right-clicked, I could zoom in a little bit, too. Okay, that's cool. Alright, so, facing the moon. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship, or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. That's pretty crazy to think about. And this is the guy that... That was weird. The game kind of freaked out for a second. Um, but yeah, the idea that he went through this to come up with his stories. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. Or is this just a story that he had? See, that's the other thing, too. I don't know if this is like a 
uh, what is it, autobiography? Or if this is just a story? The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know. For my slumber, though troubled and dream infested, was continuous. That's pretty crazy. And that reminds me a lot of um, playing Death Stranding. Now, I, now I'm curious if that's where, if this is where that imagery comes from, from his stuff. When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified would, than astonished. I would think so. This definitely seems like something to be more scared of than than For the amazed by. In the air and in the rotting soil, a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other, less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty nasty looking. It's interesting because I don't know if there are any major oil spills by this point in history. So if if something like this kind of thing was to be in his, his vision or his dream, you know, it doesn't look too unlike stuff that we've seen now. So I just, that's kind of cool. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. I would think so. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. Okay, Dagon seems to be inspired by Fishhead, a short novel by Irvin S. Cobb about unnatural affinities between a hybrid idiot and the strange fish of an isolated lake. Supernatural horror in literature, H.P. Lovecraft. Okay, so yeah, it's based on like a, a, it's a story, not not an autobiography. I mean, at this point, you know, I would kind of think it's not something he actually experienced, but who knows? Uh, Lovecraft's dream about a strange island emerging from the ocean and him crawling in the ooze that covered its surface. I dream that the whole hideous crawl and can yet feel the ooze sucking me down. In defense of Dagon, H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft's interest in the topic stemmed from his aversion to fish and sea smells. In his own words, I have hated fish and feared the sea and everything connected with it since I was two years old, but I cannot recall what earlier experience gave me such a profound and lasting aversion to the sea and seafood. The Dweller in Darkness, Lovecraft. 1927, Donald Wandre. Wandre? I mean, that's... I can kind of... I can kind of concur that you, you got to have some kind of a deep-seated fear of this kind of thing in order to come up with something this gross. Ew. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface. Exposing regions mm. for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. Mm. So great Doesn't was sound the too far off. of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might. That's kind of nasty looking. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. No, uh, no trivia pieces here. 
Just moving on? Okay. For several hours, I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. Yeah, I mean, what are you gonna do except, you know, you can't just sit here in this nasty, tarry thing. Right? Who else is gonna find you there? I wouldn't think there'd be many, uh, many people out in this kind of a place looking for anyone on the third morning i found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease the odor of the fish was maddening but i was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil and set out boldly for an unknown goal i mean it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of um whole lot of anything on the horizon to lead you to expecting you're going to find something. So, yeah. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That's pretty nasty looking. Like, I don't know what kind of creature that's supposed to be from, but it looks pretty nasty. Well, that's definitely a whale. I don't know what these, like, tentacles, like, things with the spikes, they kind of remind me of, like, uh, like ant lines from Half-Life 2. following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. Right, nothing, no other, okay. Keep looking around in case I got those trivia things coming up, but... By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance. That's usually the way that happens, right? Looks rather steep, too. An intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night. But ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain. I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Okay. So was the hill behind us? Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. And in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Well, yeah. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. The crest of the eminence. Just that way of saying it is pretty awesome. Okay. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Hmm. 
Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. They definitely limit what you can look at <laughs> sometimes. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent. Whilst after you a say drop so. of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Well, I guess we should go. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath. Gazing into the Stygian deeps, where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. An object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. It looks kind of bluish to me, but hey, okay. Was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself. But I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. You know, automatically, when I see this, it starts to make me think of like the uh, the monolith from 2001. So I almost wonder how much of that maybe was inspired by this story. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. For despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young. That definitely starts to sound like the monolith from 2001. I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, Yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. Does it want me to surround, uh, examine them more closely? Doesn't look like there's a whole lot that I can. Okay, so that's to go forward again. And I don't see any other um, elder sign things. Some sounds over here. Ooh, the moon, some water. Now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm. And revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith. Cyclopean? That's a word. surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me and unlike anything I'd ever seen in books consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Dagon contains many themes and storytelling methods that Lovecraft developed in his later works, such as telling the story through carvings at the Mountains of Madness, the Nameless City, journals and characters' notes, The Shadow Out of Time, The Haunt of the Dark, 
Haunter of the Dark, uh, islands emerging from the ocean, the Call of Cthulhu, or fictional beings and deities based on real events and mythologies. My go in the Whisper in the Darkness. It's also considered the origin of the popular Cthulhu mythos. Some of Lovecraft's other stories also conclude in a manner similar to Dagon, but let's skip the detail in order not to spoil the ending. Appreciate that. Plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size were an array of bas reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Dore. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men. Though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto. Hmm. Or paying homage at some monolithic shrine, which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their well. faces and forms I dare not speak in detail. For the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. The remembrance of how the images looked made him grow faint. That's pretty Grotesque intense. The imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. Oh. They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. Hmm. For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty intense. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. I mean, that's what I would assume in this kind of situation. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Doesn't seem too unreasonable. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Doesn't sound silent. Can hear waves lapping. Then, suddenly, I saw it. The water? Is that what it is? With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. What is it? Darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith, about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms. The while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. I can't say I blame him. Of my frantic ascent of the slope. And of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. We made it there, though. So that's pretty cool. I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. That sounds like a pretty reasonable... Uh Thing to do. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm sometime after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard pearls of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest moods. Out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital. Wow, that's a change. Brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Well, of course, you're just a guy that was stuck at sea, they're not going to listen to much of what you had to say. In the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. 
nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. That's reasonable. Lovecraft was a prominent figure in the world of amateur journalism. In 1915, he started publishing his own journal called The Conservative, which included political and social commentary, poetry, short stories, and literature criticism written by him and other authors. Howard was a skilled wordsmith, but he also took criticisms to heart, which resulted in his decision to step away from writing poetry and concentrate on weird fiction again, for the first time since his teenage years. Dagon, published in 1919, is one of the short stories written during that period. In this example excerpt from The Conservative, the master of horror fiction explains his attitude towards warfare and the idea of world peace. Why any sane human why any sane human being can believe in the possibility of universal peace is more than the conservative can fathom. Should the entire civilized world agree simultaneously to disarm, one or more nations would undoubt undoubtedly retain secret armaments and at the proper time take advantage of their more altruistic and less astute contemporaries in a wild career of conquest against unarmed victims. No country is or ever can be above warfare until the basic impulses of the human animal shall have miraculously changed. I can't disagree with that. There's always going to be people that want to hold on to it and just not be willing to let it go, right? Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist. Oh yeah? And amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. Oh, okay. So that's where the name comes from. Dagon, or Dagon, was the main deity of the Philistines worshipped throughout the Middle East as the ancient god of fertility and crops. In Hebrew, the word Dagon was a common noun for a grain. The rulers of Akkad, or Mesopotamia, chose him as the patron saint of their war conquests. He also appeared as the judge of the dead in an Assyrian poem and an underworld prison ward, uh, prison warder in one of the Babylonian texts. He is often mistakenly taken for a fish god due to the wrong interpretations of his name, as in Hebrew the word dag means fish. In H.P. Lovecraft's works, Dagon was, the, was an underwater deity ruling over the Deep Ones, a humanoid race with the fish traits that resides in the oceans. He is worshipped by a secret cult called the Esoteric Order of Dagon. Oh. Interesting. Alright, and that's all that. Okay. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. That guy's got a copy of the Necronomicon. That's the only thing he can read there. So, <laughs> tells you where, uh, where his interest lies. Uh, August Derleth was an American writer and anth uh, anthologist. He also befriended Lovecraft and published many of his works through his company Arkham House. Although, the greatly contributed, although he greatly contributed to the popularization of the author's works after his death, he is surrounded by numerous controversies. One of his most questionable decisions involving, involved introducing the good versus evil doctrine, Derleth was a devout Catholic to the Cthulhu mythos, which contrasted with Lovecraft's view of the world and his approach to cosmic horror. As a result, the author's works are often misunderstood and misrepresented in today's culture. It is also worth noting that Lovecraft was never really interested in creating a mythology, and the term Cthulhu mythos was coined by Derleth after the author left the mortal plane. Oh. So he had no interest in creating this whole thing that exists now, I guess. Not surprising, really. It's a shame, though, when, when somebody, like, hijacks a story, you know, or somebody else's ideas and turns it into something other than what they had intended. Okay. Oh. Were there secret things like that all throughout that I haven't been paying any attention to? That would stink. So there have been things that have been missing. 
Uh, these days the word scientist is a widely accepted term, but at the time Dagon was published, it was subject to a wide debate. After the author used it in the story, critics pointed out that man of science was a more appropriate term to employ. He admitted the in defense of Dagon that if Dagon were to be uh, if Dagon were to be reprinted, he would indeed use the phrase they suggested. Scientist was coined as an analog to artist to be used when referring to those studying different branches of science. Yet in the 19th and early 20th century, scientific researchers in Great Britain and the United States were of the opinion that man of science, resembling the term man of letters, was the only proper choice. Among, the other, th among other things, it was gender specific, indicating that science was an endeavor to be pursued by only one sex. The term scientist became more accepted only after World War II, and man of science started fading into obscurity as an old-fashioned synonym. Hey, either way, I think it sounds cool. Now I'm just frustrated. I hope I didn't miss a lot of other things like that throughout the story because of not zooming in everywhere. Oh well. If I did, I did. It is at night. Especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Lovecraft hated tobacco, even though he used to smoke when he was 12 in order to look and feel like an adult. In his correspondence with friend Reinhard Kleiner, he claims that he quit as soon as he started wearing long pants. Okay. He also had a very strong opinion about alcohol, as evidenced by his letter Zeal to Zelia Brown, dated the 13th of February, 1928. As for the matter of drinking, I have never tasted intoxicating liquor and never intend to. Having a strong uh, aesthetic disgust... I think that's ascetic, not aesthetic. Having a strong aesthetic disgust at anything which blunts or courses the delicate natural equipoise of the, the evolved human intellect and imagination. Drinking excited my personal repugnance, hence I don't drink. Let the herd do what they will. I am rather in favor of prohibition, the prohibition of any, any one antisocial force as well as of any other. The source of The Spirit of Revision, Lovecraft's Letters to Zelia Brown, Reed Bishop, H.P. Lovecraft, Sean Brennery, and Andrew Lehman, S.T. Joshi. Okay. I don't see any other things. Okay. Often, I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm. A mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. I mean, that seems reasonable. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. Hmm. That's an interesting uh, imagery there. The end is near. It's interesting too, because even that whole the footsteps in like the the liquidy stuff that's how the the bts come after you in death stranding 
So I do kind of think that there's a bit of, um... I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. Yeah, so I definitely think that there is some, uh, some inspiration from this to that. Oh, he's pushing against the door. It's not even footsteps. Okay. It shall not find me. I think it did. God, that hand. The window, the window. What about the window? We're going to go for it. I guess we're going for it. That's a sound. Thank you for playing. We hope you enjoyed immersing yourself in our little pool of cosmic horror. We would appreciate if you took a moment to rate Dagon and check out our other games and DLCs. Okay. Well, that was that was cool. That was neat. Um It was cool. Finding out some of the stuff was uh, was especially neat. I liked the... Oh, so look. Yeah, there were a whole bunch of them I never even got. Wow. Wow. I only got like half of them. Show you this again. Sorry. I only caught like half of the branches. I almost want to go back and do it again on my own time just to see what the other the other ones were but uh that was neat so there's even one after the tobacco and alcoholism thing well even so that was pretty cool and uh if you made it this far good on you good on me maybe for being entertaining enough or for the game being entertaining enough i mean it's not a game technically but you know whatever anyway uh if you guys did enjoy it please like subscribe uh, give me a comment. Let me know what you thought was cool, what wasn't. If you have any ideas of any other kind of short games like this maybe to play and uh, make videos of. And um, like I said before, I stream on Twitch, twitch.tv slash robsteady. Uh, don't really have a schedule at this point, but just in general going to be trying to do some more. So anyway, hope you guys have a good one. And uh, until next time, enjoy life. Bye.